reading from the Holy Spirit through the Acts of the Apostles. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira, Thyatira, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. This is a reading from the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John in his revelation as to us. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. Come down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Judy and Dean, for sharing with us this word of the Lord, a word of the Lord that speaks to the early church's time of of being in the gospel and to the last day, the eternity of being in the gospel. Jesus speaks to us now of being alive in that day, this day time of the gospel. Come, let's rise together and sing. Jesus, we love you. We praise you and adore
here the gospel of our Lord is found in the Apostle John's Gospel, chapter 16, starting at verse 23. Jesus was teaching his disciples in the upper room prior to his crucifixion and burial, saying, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. And then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. Well, this makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe? Jesus replied. A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Earlier this morning in our 830 worship, we had the privilege of welcoming three families. Uh, There's only two listed for you there. I I had my wires crossed up, and I thought that Abby Holly was going to be in Iowa this weekend, but she was here. And so Abby Holly is added to who you see there. Abby is the daughter of Steve and Lori uh, Barron. We welcome Steve and Lori today, and also Gary and Denise Pingle into fellowship of membership with us here at Bethany. Next Sunday at our 11 o'clock worship, we'll be uh, inviting and welcoming, I should say, uh, three more families into our fellowship. But today, we gather with these truths among us, my friends, that we gather in the delight of welcoming into the Lord's fellowship with us you who are eager to join in this mission and ministry we know as Bethany. They join us in confessing the faith to which we have been called and declare their commitment to the truths that we know in Christ. And so, in the joy of the Lord, and as pastor of Bethany Lutheran Church and Early Childhood Education Center, I ask you, as one who has been made holy by God's great mercy and grace, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And I ask you, do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I ask you, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the confession of faith to which we are called, to which these new folks join us in declaring the wonders of our saving God. So, my friends, our Heavenly Father has brought these new friends in Christ into the fellowship of this congregation. Through the Holy Spirit and His power, we extend our hands and hearts to them, welcoming them as a brother or sister, a fellow servant of our Lord. They join us in declaring the wonderful deeds of our Savior who has given us the mission of sharing the life and love of Jesus Christ with all. In Jesus' name, we welcome you as a servant with us in the kingdom of the Lord. Membership and participation in the Christian church is a privilege we highly prize. Together, we will strive to use well the gifts God has given each one of us. As his people, we welcome you with open hearts and are united in prayer that you may be filled with the Spirit. One day the Lord will extend to us the heavenly welcome, 
and give us the crown of victory. On that day we will rejoice that the Holy Spirit has called and kept us in Jesus Christ. May our Lord bless and keep us together in his service, and we will continue to gather, grow, and go in the name of Christ. Welcome to this fellowship of Jesus. Amen. It's important that we do that, even though those people may not be here right now, but that we remind ourselves of this welcome, to which we, at one day, were welcomed as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we hear your word now, as Jesus speaks to us in the gospel, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, O Lord, be pleasing to you, and may you grow us continually in your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, please uh, be seated. And there's an outline for you on the, the back side of your, uh, your bulletin if you want to follow along today and uh, take some notes as we hear the Lord's word to us in John chapter 16. And you know that, that context uh, for understanding a situation, a, a conversation, is, is paramount so that the uh, the view of what's uh, being uh, given there is, is fully understood, so that the truth might be grasped, right? A context of when, say, you get a phone call, and it's one of your children. Dad, um, I slid into a telephone pole. I'm a little shaken up. Can you come and help me? And, and so to understand the context, you call back and say, well, wh where are you? Uh, is anybody hurt? Uh, what's the damage like? We need to have a tow truck and you find all that information out, you get to the site and you realize, okay, it's just a little dent in the bumper. It was a great learning experience. Nobody was hurt. Uh, no damage was done. And we learned how to not corner so fast on slippery roads. Okay, context complete. Isn't that right, Anna? <laughs> and I can say that to her because I had that same experience when I was her age. Uh, you, you know, you need to learn these things, don't you, my dear daughter? Yeah, and you understand the context of what's going on in life is critical. Well, you can just imagine uh, the insurance company or the police trying to gather the context of, of, of these kind of telephone pole uh, exercises. When the person says, an invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my car, and vanished. Okay, getting the context of what, what that means for this person. Or, or the, this one, the pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran over him. <laughs> or, or this one, the telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path, but it struck my front end. You know? <laughs> well, this one rings true for maybe some of us. The indirect cause of this accident was a little guy uh, with a small car and a big mouth. Now, here's my favorite one. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed right for the embankment. <laughs> <laughs> maybe some of you can relate to that. Well. Context is important for us in making sense of a situation that we're dealing with. For Jesus and his disciples, the context in which we hear this gospel reading for us today is the, the upper room setting prior to uh, Jesus being betrayed, at his time in the garden with prayer, his, uh, his being handed over to the chief priests and the authorities, his crucifixion and his burial. And Jesus is giving to his disciples some, some, some last-minute kind of teachings before he says, or before he ascends, and as he says, in that, that day, in that day. And what Jesus is, is longing for his disciples, in the context in which they're going to find themselves living, is, is success with this gospel message that they've been given. Now, success for us, as God's men and women, is defined very differently, we know, than the way of the world. It's not defined by those same standards of the gold standard or the diploma on the wall or what we've achieved in time in life. Success, as the Lord Jesus defines it for us as God's people, in the context of faith and life in him, success is faithfulness. Jesus calls us to faithfulness in this time from when he ascends until he returns. In the context for which we find Jesus speaking to his disciples today in this upper room, he says three times, in that day. Jesus is talking about that day from his ascension until he returns again. In that day. Now, for us in a Western thinking world, that day, we often go to a 24-hour period, but for a Hebrew thinker, as Jesus was, in that day re refers to this time frame.
frame, not a 24-hour period, but a time frame from when he ascended until he returns again. And Jesus is saying, in that day, this time in which you live, my disciples, there's some truths that I want you to know and live by that will define success or faithfulness as you live in me in the world. This is what faithfulness, success, looks like in me as you live in that day, as you live now. Jesus says, though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, this is the second time Jesus uses that phrase, today, these days in which we find ourselves living, in that day you will ask in my name, And I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father loves you because you have loved me. Jesus gives us this truth in verse 27. That the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. Now right away, that may cause some some concern for us because, boy, that sure sounds like that if if I love the Father, he's going to love me. But if I don't love the Father, does that mean he doesn't love me? That's not how God's love for us works. And here's the difference. The difference is that Jesus uses the word for love of filio. And filio kind of love is defined by to have affection for someone. It's not the agape kind of love that Jesus uses to describe for God so loved the world. God so agape the world that he gave his son. Agape kind of love is love that is unconditional. Our Heavenly Father loves us as people, not us as the church only, but He loves human beings. And He loves us so much, He agapes us so much, that of His will, unconditionally, He sends His Son Jesus to die for all humankind, whether we love Him or not, whether we're in faith or not. Our Father still loves us. But filial love is a love that's expressed already in a relationship. It's a filial love that is reflective or demonstrative because a relationship has been established. And so, in this day, or Jesus is saying, in that day, my disciples, my men and women, as you live between my ascension and my return again, know that The Father loves you because you've shown a reflective, demonstrative kind of love towards him in what he has first established with you by agapeing you. A willful love for you in which he gives his son Jesus. So this filial love is a is a, is a term of, of faithfulness or success that Jesus says marks our lives as his men and women. A reflective, demonstrative kind of love that you know as my people, in my Father, even among yourselves. It's an acted out and lived out reflection of what we already know in Jesus. In Jesus, our Savior. In Jesus, our Redeemer, our forgiver of sins and cleanser of souls. Jesus, who out of the Father's willful agape love for us, we are claimed in the kingdom of our Heavenly Father. So now we might love him too. Filio marks a success, a faithfulness for us. Jesus goes on to say, and, I, and, 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 and you believe that I came from God. In verse 28 he says, I came from the Father and entered the world, and now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Well, then Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Well, now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech, and we can see and know that uh, you know all things, and you don't have to have anybody ask you questions, Jesus. And Jesus, uh, they say, This makes us believe that you came from God. And Jesus responds back to them, do you now believe? Is this why you believe? And Jesus says, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home, and you will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. 
Jesus speaks uh, the second kind of mark for us as God's people, a mark of faithfulness, which, which uh, defines the success of people living in the Lord at this time, which is marked by this gift of faith, or as we know in the Greek, pisteo, which is a, a, to believe in with confidence. Now, Jesus is saying to his disciples, you all are going to scatter and abandon me one day. But even if you do, I'm not alone. Because I have something that you're going to have too. My Father is with me. And remember, Jesus would tell his disciples, I'm sending you my spirit so that my presence might be with you as you live in these days. That's called faith. A confidence that we live in with, uh, and believe that the presence of Jesus is among us now, living and moving and stirring and, and giving us, well, giving us divine courage. Divine courage. When I think about, when I think about the disciples of Jesus and, and I think about them going on from this time in, in the upper room discourse with the Lord and, and living out the days ahead after Jesus ascended, I think about those disciples in, in the example of li them living in divine courage that, that might, for me too, be a, a, an opportunity to live in, in faith, this kind of uh, belief in, in confidence. And right away, uh, m my, my heart, my, my thinking goes to this guy who was sitting with Jesus in the upper room in this J uh, John chapter 16, and, and just a few months ago knew what it was like to experience divine courage. And it was Peter. When Jesus invited him to come out on the stormy lake, leaving the comfort and safety of the boat, and exercise faith. Peter, you believe in me in the courage and strength to which I give you that would allow you to move out of the boat and come to me. Divine courage. These last weeks, we've been moving through a momentum campaign that have called us to exercise divine courage. We've called it stepping out in faith. And we're crossing over together in unity. And we're building on the promises of God. Next Sunday, we, we come together as a congregation. And if you haven't had an opportunity to um, give a faith goal yet, we're asking you to use next Sunday as an opportunity to dedicate unto the Lord your faith goal. Which means then that during this week, if you haven't done this yet, you're going to have an opportunity to step out in faith, to exercise divine courage, and say unto the Lord, yes, Father, we believe you're calling us in this direction. We as a congregation have embraced this together. And it's my turn now to step out in faith, exercising divine courage, and give to you my faith goal for where you're calling me, where you're calling us, where you're taking us. I want you to know that if you haven't done this yet, um, we're praying for you. I'm praying for you. And next Sunday will be an opportunity, an opportunity for us to demonstrate, well, faithfulness as a congregation together in divine courage, stepping out in faith. May the Lord bless you mightily as you exercise divine courage. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but, he says, take heart. I have overcome the world. Faith, love, and Paul would say there's a third one to the church in Corinth. Hope. Hope. Hope is what defines us as God's people. Thoreso, the Spirit would say, is to have courage and joy in the midst of the world. Why? Because we are rooted, standing firm in the living hope of Jesus Christ who lives in us and among us. Because his love for us defines us. And we see that love that Filio then demonstrated among us. And we see that person of Jesus reflected in a living faith that gives us a divine courage to step forward at God's calling and move in the direction that he's called us to move. And we live there in hope, this kind of hope that has the courage and joy in the midst of where we find ourselves 
in this day. At that time. John had a habit, as he would in his gospel, and in those three letters that he would later pen by the inspiration of the Spirit, and in the revelation that he was given, John had a habit of of writing in a a style that appealed to insiders. That that is, people of faith, members of the church, who understood the, uh, the mysteries of God's grace at work in our lives. That's why he could lay out for us, as Jesus does today in the gospel, that that love and faith and hope, those are marks of faithfulness, of success in in people's lives, in these days in which we live. It's kind of insider language that the Spirit uses. So some of you will know this when when I share this with you. There's a commercial on TV right now about mowing your grass. And Sam and I get it, because Sam and I are the grass mowers in our family. Anna and Sue, not so much, because they're not the grass mowers in our family. So when this commercial comes on TV, Sam and I look at each other and give each the thumbs up. And it's this commercial. It's not how fast you mow. It's how well you mow fast. You've heard that, right? Now, if you mow grass, you get that. Yeah, it's how well you mow fast. But the the non-grass mowers in our family, they don't quite get that. It's insider language. Insider language speaks to the truth, to what we've been given. The Father's love for us in Jesus Christ, that unconditional, willful love of his salvation that we have, that's exercised among us in a brotherly affection for one another, in a tenderness and care for each other in the Lord, for a living faith that demonstrates divine courage as we move day in and day out as God's people until he returns again one day, and a hope that plants us firmly where we are in that message that even though Jesus has ascended, We celebrate each day this victory that the Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Father in heaven, may the faithfulness of your call of Jesus in our hearts and lives, that success to which you have determined in our hearts and lives is marked by by the call of love and, and faith and hope. So mark our lives, Heavenly Father, for your purposes. And as we live and wait for your return again, as these words of truth, this, this, uh, this, this day of truth is for us, marked uh, by you, O oh Lord, may you be given the glory and the honor and the praise. And we'll thank you because we're claimed as your children. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks and praise. Hear us, Heavenly Father. Amen. May the peace of God, my brothers and sisters, that passes our understanding, well, may it now keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, your Lord and Savior. May you know the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father in your heart and life through Jesus, your Savior.